Amen, amen, amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand? It's wonderful. Good morning. So why don't you guys take a seat? Um, Dwayne's going to actually bring a very short word today. And um, so I wonder if I could just, you know, I'm not getting to preach today. It's never about a person. Good morning. With me, they always say whenever he doesn't get to preach, he always finds a little opportunity. So uh, I'm just going to read you one little section of scripture. Every, every year at Christmas, I, I just kind of read the whole story through all the Gospels. And I just ask the Lord to just illuminate in my heart one or two things. And then often from those things, I, I launch into something of what I believe the Lord wants to say to us. So I wondered if the kids would read this one of these. I didn't want to steal that from them, but they didn't. So I'm just going to read you a section of scripture. It's in Luke uh, chapter 1, and um, when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and it says this, Now Mary in those days went into the hill country with haste to a city, uh, to the city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth, that's the mother of John the Baptist, Elizabeth was already pregnant with John the Baptist, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe, being John the Baptist, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So who was the first to declare, to recognize, to, in a sense, point to the Messiah? Who was the first? An unborn child. Just think about that. An unborn child. I don't know how that works, but I believe, do you believe the Bible? It was an unborn child that recognized the Messiah, the first one. Lord, help our generation. And then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, Elizabeth speaking, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, now Mary begins to prophesy, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Is that not true? For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown his strength with his arm. In Isaiah 53, it says, prophesying of the, of the Messiah, of the coming Christ, it says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Here it's revealed. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty with their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. And he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his great mercy. As he spoke, to our fathers, their forefathers, to Abraham and his seed forever, his seed being Christ. And I just wanted to read that to you to give us a perspective that Jesus, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, had. She is called blessed. Some worship her incorrectly. She was just a person. But God used her mightily in the sense that she birthed our king in the incarnation. But what struck me when I read that, and I just wanted to share it with you, is that Mary had such an understanding, which sometimes I think is lost today. She said, thousands of years ago, something started with a man called Abraham. Now, we know it started even before that. But she said, because of Abraham and all the prophets and everything that happened, there's a context to which I, in a sense, arrive on the scene, nothing of my own doing, not by my own strength, not by my own thoughts. I just happen to be here, and I believe the Lord. And something is taking place that will cause me to look wonderful, but it's in the context of something that God has been doing and involved with for thousands of years. And I'm just doing my part. And the church is the same, yeah? You may be greatly gifted. And today we said, and you may have great gifts, an amazing preacher or amazing businessman or amazing whatever it may be. But there's a context to the kingdom. And however great you become, however greatly God uses you, it's in the context of something that's been happening from generation to generation to generation. And it all points back to the Lord, to that moment, and it all points forward because he's now coming on a horse when he comes back as a king. 
Amen. Dwayne Stanley, that's his second name, middle name. He does. He rejoices for everyone to know it. Can I pray for you? Absolutely. Father, I thank you for this man. I thank you for his, his humble heart. I really do. And I thank you for his honor of the word and of you. And we bless him this evening as he shows your word. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas. I'm going to feel strange. I had to catch myself to not saying good morning to everybody. But Merry Christmas as a kid. I obviously love Christmas like all kids should. And it was probably a frenzy. I mean, there was just stuff. And the older I get, the more I, I want peace. I want peace. <laughs> and I actually want to talk about peace today. It is, well, you're going to see a miracle, of course, because I'm going to preach in 15 minutes. That is the goal. It's 534, so my mark is 550. But I want to pray, or pray and, and talk about peace because it was read today, and, and I think Jacob read it or one of the others read it. You know, when the angels appeared, and Greg actually talked about this. If you're here with us this past Sunday, he talked about what happened in that moment when the, the heavenly hosts appeared and sang. And they say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And, you know, growing up, we had an ornament on the tree. It's just classic peace on earth. And that very phrase means a lot of different things to a lot of people. But as the, the prophetic word was spoken by the angels, it's peace to men on whom his favor rests. We as recipients of his grace, that's favor. If you received his grace, you received his favor. So peace is yours. But peace is such an odd thing and such a desperately needed thing today because of the fact that there's such turmoil, there's a lot of anxiety. I mean, you pick your issue, it probably exists today. And peace is something greatly treasured. I treasure it personally and for, and for my household. And you know, there is a well-known verse that you could probably quote to me. It's Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Talk about, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And there's, that's such a well-known verse, and I'm not actually here to talk about that verse. There is theology there, and it is something that is part of your life, but I actually want to talk about that verse, but not about that verse itself, but talk about the context of that verse. It's very important. Every, every verse in the Bible, every chapter of the Bible exists in a context. That's why one of the rules of interpretation is you just don't look at a single verse in isolation. And Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, obviously follows a particular passage. And this is the preface, and I'm going to read starting in verse 2. And it says, I plead with you, Uodiah, and I plead with you, Suntuke, I think that's the way to pronounce it, to agree with each other in the Lord. So the context is disagreement. These actually were workers in the church, and I know... A lot of us can easily look at the Bible as being a little bit of theory, a little bit divorced from the reality. And if you can imagine that there was a church with a disagreement, that two people in the church didn't quite get along. This is the context of Philippians chapter 4. And I'm just going to skip down to verse 4. And then it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And for many years, I've read these verses, and they seem sort of random to me. They seem so disconnected. Very interesting verses. But yet, for me, there was not as much life in it. Like, what exactly is the point of these verses? Because I know Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, you can quote that, but that follows this set of verses, and it said it was partly in the context of a little bit of disagreement. So Clayton, as he just said, he mentioned the word rejoice. And that's actually such a key word in this little section. See, that word rejoice is actually the first word that Jesus spoke to the women after he was resurrected. That's the very first, it's the same word. 
But that's the first word. And in Matthew 28, this is the context. And I'm going to read it. And you're thinking, this is Christmas, not Easter. But bear with me. In Matthew 28, starting verse 8, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. That's the New King James translation where it actually uses the word rejoice. And other translations, such as the NIV or the ESV, instead of rejoice, they say greetings. I find that to be quite an unfortunate translation because you just have to understand the context of where this initial meeting and statement was made where Jesus' command, it is a command by, by verb tense, it was an imperative, which is basically a command. And he says, rejoice. You know, because you have to understand to the women what was the context of meeting Jesus post-resurrection and hearing him say rejoice. And if you can, just try and do this. You've read the New Testament, but try and look at it from their perspective of living in a world where the New Testament had not yet been written. It had not yet been, they were actually living through a process that would be memorialized in the New Testament. So you have to appreciate where they had come. And as was read today in Luke 2.17, there was this promise, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men upon whom his favor rests. The very next verse in verse 17, it talks about the shepherds. And it says, when they had seen him, they spread the word. After they had seen Jesus in the manger, they actually began to spread the word of Christ, the Savior who has been born. Now you understand Jesus grew up. And when he started his ministry 30 years later, when he started his ministry, and he's looked at the multitudes that were gathered in the, you know, prior to the feeding of 5,000, and he looked at the multitude, and his comment that was recorded was that, they were like sheep that were scattered, like sheep without a shepherd. That's how he described the people. And in the course of his ministry, he became that shepherd, healing, delivering, caring for, practically working out being the shepherd to the sheep who had no other shepherd at that time. And then in, in Matthew 26, prior to his arrest, he says to his disciples, he says, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that word scattered is the same word used to talk about winnowing grain. It's, it's literally sifting, separating the grain from the chaff. And Jesus, who became their shepherd, said, on this night, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So if you were one of the disciples that, were, that was in that instance, not knowing the New Testament that would be fulfilled and written, this was the context. Because every hope and dream of understanding the word that was spread upon his birth, that this is Christ, the Savior of the world, all of those dreams and hopes would have been dashed on his death and his burial. That's just the reality of the life that they The level of fear and uncertainty and anxiety that they would have existed, everything was in turmoil. I'm sure as between themselves, they couldn't even agree. Because nothing of what they imagined that was to be the onslaught or the onset of a political kingdom actually came to fruition because he's dead and he has been buried. That's the context. They don't know the end of the story. They're living the story. So amidst their confusion, their fear, and anxiety, as they left the empty tomb, and they meet their Savior, and his first word to them is, rejoice. As an imperative, as a command, not something to be done one time, but something to be done ongoingly. That was his command. And how would that have impacted them? 
It's not an Easter sermon, it's a Christmas sermon. You see, in Matthew 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. That is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You see, after 33 years, upon his death, upon his burial, and now his resurrection, only then could they truly comprehend and realize the name Emmanuel, God with us. You see, in John chapter 14, verse 18, Jesus said, speaking of actually what was to come in terms of the Holy Spirit, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That was his promise to his disciples. And when he was struck and they were scattered, surely if they had recalled one of his sermons and recalled that word, this now would have been the fulfillment for them of everything that they believed to be true. And just like we have one of the sayings here is hope realized. That was the significance of the term rejoice. You see... In Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is near is the capstone, in a sense, representing the experience that the women had, meaning Jesus post-resurrection, because his very presence fulfilled their understanding now truly of the name Emmanuel, God with us. They thought they had been left as orphans, but they now actually have been received in his very presence, the name Emmanuel. And that's the Christmas story. Not as a one-time reality for us, but for us to live out ongoingly as a reality where you can say and follow then the command to rejoice in the Lord, always. That's the Christmas story. You see, and I will make just something very practical because I talked about verses six and seven in Philippians chapter four. It says, do not be anxious about everything, anything. There is a peace from God that exists only in his presence. When the Lord truly is near and when you perceive him and in his presence and we value his presence, we do. This is the last message for 2021 going on in 2022 and I would say that one of the desires for us as a body, as a people, not a leadership, as a people, I'm trusting, is a value for his his presence in increasing measure so that you will say on your own and for us collectively, the Lord is near. That is Emmanuel, God with us. And as a practical consequence of his nearness and his very presence, that security, see, it's very easy to think of requests that we can make to God through prayer. But let me tell you that in his presence, What brings you peace is not the request and the potential fulfillment of that. It's just the presence of the one that you're bringing the request to. That's all it is. That is what brings peace. And that is his promise to you. It was prophesied that he would be Emmanuel to us. It was prophesied that. It was fulfilled from Isaiah chapter 7. And with the disciples' experience, it took them 33 years to actually understand what exactly that name meant. But it was fulfilled. It is being fulfilled for us to this day. And I'm actually trusting that it is going to be fulfilled in greater measure for us in the reality of our experience in the coming year. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Would you just close your eyes? I'd love to just pray for us. Lord, I 
just thank you. It is a cry of our heart in adoration for you. You are the king. You are the one with a name above every name. It is you who is the one who is worthy to receive our praise and adoration, and we will rejoice, for the Lord is near. And I just pray for us. I pray for us as we go into our homes, as we spend time even just in fleeting moments, and I pray that your presence, your presence would be tangible, would be manifest, would become an expectation of us, Emmanuel, God with us. So we honor you, O oh Lord. We honor you this day. We honor you with our lives. We thank you, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, see, peace on earth. I wonder if we could do just one little last thing, just to end. Young child, children under the age of 10, if your parents will allow it, this is not planned, I'm going to get in trouble with the staff, but that's okay because the office is closed. So uh, if, if, you allow, if you allow your children, could all the, little, all the kids just come and stand right up here? You guys have been so good. And I want you kids to know that church can also be fun and wonderful. All of you, come up. All of you, run, run, run. You can run this one time. Just this one time. All right. Well done, guys. Hey, can, can all of you look at me real quick? All of you kids look at me. All right. Can I just say something to you? Hey, hey, you three. Ethan, hello. All right. Can I just tell you that God loves you guys so much, you don't even know yet, but He loves you with all of His heart. You know that? He really, really does. Now, you guys have been so good. Can I ask you, the adults are going to be quiet, can I ask you to, but when I say stop, you stop, right? Fair? Deal? Great. Shout as loud as you can. One, two, three, go. All right, stop. Well done. Oh, he was late to the party. You can shout all night all night. All right, why don't we stand? Guys, thank you so much. Can my, can my family come up here? Jen, Matthew, Michael, can we come up here quick, quickly? Matthew, Michael, come up here. Onto, they've not been up here with me before. And so we just wanted to say from our family to yours, Merry Christmas. Uh, we love you all, and some of you love us. That's nice. <laughs> and, uh, and just Merry Christmas. I encourage you to have a wonderful, fun time with your family. Dwayne, thank you for a very powerful Really, a good message. Can we just give him a hand? We thank you so much. All right, Matthew, can you say Merry Christmas? Merry Christmas. All right. Bless you guys. See you next year. Amen.